Section 8 of Ancient Ideals in Modern Life. Four Lectures. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Ideals in Modern Life. Four Lectures by Annie Besant. Womanhood. Part 1. My Brothers. It has been said that the position of woman in any civilization shows the stage of evolution at which that civilization has arrived, and if that maxim be taken as accurate, then there can be no kind of doubt as to the height of civilization attained in ancient India, when we contemplate the position which there was held by women, and study the types that then were found in the land. You may search the history of the world, you may turn over the pages of the world's literature. Nowhere will you find stronger, sweeter, and more beautiful types of womanhood than you find in the ancient literature of India. It seems as if every ideal virtue, as if every possible grace, had been gathered together, had been welded into human forms, and then those forms set on high to attract the admiration of the world. The names of some of these great women are familiar as household words, both in the East and in the West. Western writers, Western thinkers, Western philosophers have not been slow to recognize their ideal beauty and to point to them as showing out the perfection of womanhood, as giving to the world types which have never been excelled. I might quote to you passage after passage from Western writers, showing you the impression made upon the mind of the West by these sublime types of womanhood. I want to lay stress upon them in the beginning of this discourse, because here, as elsewhere, I look to ancient India for the model and ideal, in order to give reason and inspiration why modern India should change her ways in some very definite respects. Only as we realize the greatness of the past, only as we contrast it with the poverty of the present, can we see clearly the road along which we should direct our steps if we desire to bring back in modern days the glory of those ancient times. For as I told you in the beginning, in regard to these important questions of the day, there is a party that desires to change everything, and a party that desires to change nothing, and between these two unpractical schools the future destiny of India is swinging today. How shall we know what reforms to choose, and what to reject? unless we are familiar with the ancient ideals, unless we are able, by studying them, to recognize the goal to which our steps are to be directed. Only as these inspire us can changes be wisely chosen and steadily carried out. Only as these draw our hearts by their beauty shall we be able to raise our mother India to the position that she should occupy amid the nations of the world. In studying ancient India, there are certain points about the womanhood of that time that come out very clearly and distinctly. The theory of womanhood, that which you may call the philosophical view, the place that woman occupies in nature, the functions that are especially woman's to discharge, the great division of sexes that we find in humanity, nay, in all nature, a distinction certainly not without the profoundest meaning certainly not without its great significance in evolution. Any attempt to bridge over that difference, any attempt to turn a man into a woman or a woman into a man, means the throwing back of humanity, a check on its orderly, on its progressive evolution. Certain distinct qualities are evolved in each sex. Certain distinct powers are found assigned to the one sex or to the other, to try to unsex either is to make a fundamental blunder, and we need to have our theory clear and distinct ere our practices can be wisely and rightly directed. What then is the ancient Hindu theory as regards the nature and function of womanhood? We are told at the very beginning of creative work, when humanity was to be produced, the creator divided himself into two halves, one half male and the other female. This division of the divine into two marks, as it were, the very basis of our theory. Both sexes are equally divine. Each is one half of God. Both sexes have their part to play in human evolution and in the evolution of the world as a whole. 
The sex distinction is not simply found in humanity. It goes through all the kingdoms of nature, even though the name of sex is not universally applied. The two great sides of the manifested God in nature are found in the sexes. On one side show the different attributes and functions which in humanity are found in the male, and on the other side the attributes and functions which in humanity are found in the female. So also we know that in the whole theory of the devas, you do not find a deva without a devi. These two are inseparable, indivisible, the dual manifestation of one life, of one being. The difference of the qualities evolved renders it impossible to develop both sets simultaneously in the same physical form, hence two series of forms in which the predominant physical characteristics differ. In one of these series, the intellectual qualities find their best expression. In the other, the emotional. These forms are the male and female, and their value to evolution lies in their difference. As evolution nears its ending, the differences become less marked until the two are united, the halves of one body as at first. Half of the divine nature, then, comes forth in womanhood, that side of the divine nature which is connected with the making of forms, which gives the soil in which forms are developed, which nourishes them, guards them, protects them. In a word, the mother side of nature. That is the fundamental distinction, then, that we find in the ancient writings, that the woman represents the material side of the manifested universe, which is necessary for the manifestation of spirit. The mother side of nature, that nutritive, protective side, this is the fundamental type of womanhood and marks out woman's functions in the universe. So as we study further the ancient teachings, we notice that wherever divine power is to be manifested, wherever there is a need for the exertion of divine energy, there the female divine manifestation is called forth, appears, and executes that which needs to be done. If you turn to the well-known story of the coming forth of Durga, what do you find? You find that the world was terribly oppressed by the Asuras and that the devas did not know how to protect themselves. You find them going to the great gods for help, appealing to those divine powers for protection. And then, as the story unfolds, you find that out of the gods themselves there comes forth the mighty radiant form of Durga, that in her the divine forces were embodied. It was Durga who, by those forces and energies, delivered the world from the terror under which it was panic-stricken. It was that mighty Durga who swept out of the path of the gods the terrible antagonists who were then barring the way. Thus is shown out the idea for all times that, in the divine woman, the goddess side of nature, all power is manifested, all protection is to be sought. There is the remover of obstacles, there the one who lifts us over dangers. The divine womanhood is the refuge of the world, and at the feet of the goddess all the worlds find rest. Such is the thought, then, which continually comes out in Hindu teachings, as underlying the Hindu idea of womanhood. When we pass on still further to see how in the human being this is manifested, we find the ideal of marriage held up as constituting the complete true human being. Husband and wife are not thought of as two, but they're thought of as one. Husband and wife are not thought of as separate. They are thought of as united. Husband and wife are not thought of as capable of division. They are but two halves constituting an entire, a single, whole. Just as in the Deva and Devi one divine life is manifested, so in the husband and wife the perfect type of humanity is shown forth. There is no idea of possible antagonism. There is no idea of possible rivalry. Man and woman, husband and wife, are two halves of the complete man, of the complete human life. That perfect union, that true unity, gave the Hindu ideal of marriage. When we study the very form and physical constitution of woman, we find that this, her function in nature, is marked on her very body, as well as her inner nature. We find that the whole body of the ideal woman is formed to typify, to express, 
to show forth all the grace and strength of emotion, all the profundity and height of love. The woman typifies in the perfect human being the side of emotion, just as the man typifies in that same human being the type of intellect. Both are equally necessary. Both form parts of the perfect whole, and both are constituted in their several physical composition for the showing forth of these two characteristic marks of humanity. When the two are united, when the intellect gives the directing force and the emotion gives the impulsive force, then only is right action possible. Then only can humanity fulfill its function in the world. The two thus blended together, the two thus working as a perfect whole, give us the ideal human type towards which humanity is approaching. Anything that destroys that unity, anything that separates one sex from the other in life or interest, anything that tends to draw them apart, to bring them into competition, to set them in rivalry the one against the other, anything of that kind is fatal to the progress of the race, and is turning evolution along the road that tends downwards and not upwards. This fundamental, this true theory, is one which has to be grasped, which has to be clung to through the whole of our study of the subject. In woman, you will find the emotions most strongly shown, most fully developed. She suffers more keenly. She enjoys more keenly than man either suffers or enjoys. Therefore, in dealing with her, when we come to consider the question of education, we have to take care to the utmost to draw out her especial capacity, but also, and this is vital, to take care that it is not developed without also developing in her the other, though the subordinate side of her nature, the intellectual. Just as in man you have to prevent him from becoming hard and selfish by training and developing his emotional and moral nature, so in woman it is also necessary to train and develop the side of intelligence, else she will be unregulated and unbalanced. For though in man the intellect should dominate emotion, yet both are necessary for an all-round character. And though in woman emotion should be more highly developed than intellect, yet both should also be found in her. Then, when man and woman thus developed are joined together, there is a perfect marriage. Both are able to work together and to understand each other to be true companions, friends, and helpmates along the path of life, whereas the exaggerated development of the specific side of either and the non-development of the secondary side makes a perfect union of lives impossible, they are too far apart, have too little common ground, and there is therefore always the likelihood of jarring and disagreement, making the marriage less perfect than it ought to be, making the note that is struck less rich and less harmonious than it should be. When we come to look at the ideal of marriage union, as shown forth in Hindu literature, what do we find? We find most perfect, most unbounded love, the deepest reverence as parts of the character of the ideal wife, a fidelity that knows no possibility of change, a courage that can hold to the one against every opposing circumstance, a love that does not falter even under the uttermost strain a strength that never wavers, no matter how great the difficulty, how sore the trial. Then, on the side of the husband, we find unfailing tenderness, continual protection, power and will to guide, unfaltering love, so that in this union all the noblest relations of humanity are gathered up, and the ideal Hindu husband and the ideal Hindu wife make the most perfect picture of the marriage union that has ever served as ideal of a nation, that has ever inspired practice in right living. And when from that theory we turn to the practice in ancient India, what there do we find? The study of the ancient books shows us that woman in ancient India shines out strongly in practice, shows the characteristics of the ideal woman in all the functions, in all the duties of life. The law is laid down as to her position in the famous shlokas of Manu, where it is declared that women are to be honoured and adored by fathers and brothers, by husbands as also by brothers-in-law who desire much prosperity. Where women are honoured, there the gods rejoice, but where they are not honoured, there all rights are fruitless. Where women grieve, that family quickly perishes. 
but where they do not grieve, that family ever prospers. Houses which women not honoured curse, those as if blighted by magic, perish utterly. From Manu 3, 55, 56, 57, and 58. Passing from these precepts, which embody the theory to the practice whereof I spoke, I want to put before you certain definite facts as regards the life of woman in ancient India. The first point is as to the position of women in ancient India, in the home and outside the home, the latter a type of woman who have almost entirely disappeared from modern India. You find in ancient India that there existed a class of women who did not enter into the marriage relation. They were called by the specific name of Brahma Vadinis, teachers of the Veda. Their position was recognized, clear, and distinct. They are spoken of in the ancient law books. The special privileges that they enjoyed are clearly laid down in the sutras. We are told that women were divided into two classes, Brahma Vadinis and the married. The first class bore the sacred thread and the right of kindling the sacrificial fire, studied and taught the Vedas, and lived unmarried in their own houses. I am quoting as regards their rights and privileges from the writings of Harita, as translated. Other authorities might be quoted on the same lines. There were female ascetics as well as male ascetics. You will remember, for instance, the one who came into the court of King Janaka, carrying the danda, wearing the ascetic robes, going her way as a teacher, appearing in the very court of the king to carry on discussion on subtle points of religion and philosophy. This class of women in ancient India, these knowers of the supreme, show clearly and definitely that women in those ancient days were not excluded from the knowledge of the Vedas, were not excluded from taking part in the great discussions upon philosophy and religion, proving that the precepts against a woman studying or even hearing the Vedas must be interpolations of a later date. They were learned as men were learned, and they even taught the Vedas as men were teachers. Some of the mantras of the Vedas, some of the hymns of the Rig Veda, were originally given through women. Through their mouths the sacred mantras were spoken, which in these modern days their daughters may not study nor repeat. Not only is it true that some of the Rig verses were given by women, but we also find their names in the list of spiritual teachers, in the list of great acharyas who form the chain of spiritual teachers. I need hardly remind you that in the Upanishads you read of such a knower of Brahman as Girji, who questioned Vinyavakya in the great assembly of sages, being given her place there to put questions as she would, even without looking on that special class, even without taking those noble types of virgin womanhood. We find that the women of the household, the wives and mothers, also enjoyed a large amount of liberty and took their part in a number of public ceremonies. Some of the hymns of the Rig Veda, indeed, just mentioned, were written by wives. We also find records in the Rig Veda itself of great festivals attended by women who were wives and mothers. We find in the Ramayana that Kaushalya, the mother of Ramachandra, was actually the officiating priestess at a great sacrifice at which were gathered vast crowds of kings, of nobles, of brahmanas, and of the people at large. She performed the act of sacrifice. Hers was the hand of the officiator. We find they took part in the discussions that occurred between their husbands and sages, as in the cases of Draupati and Siti. We find them advising and counselling their husbands in matters of difficulty in matters concerning the outer world. Both Siti and Draupati showed knowledge of the world, understood the ways in which things went on in the external world, were able to give wise counsel to their husbands, to estimate the forces of opposing opinions, and to exercise judgment as to the path which it was best to follow. You find a woman called into a great assembly to give counsel, when Duryodhana had set himself against Sri Krishna, and his father, his preceptor, and his elders had all striven in vain to turn him from his purpose. As the last resort, his mother, Gandhari, was sent for. She came into that great assemblage, and there addressed her son in words of remonstrance, reproof, and counsel, showing how in those days women were really wise and great, 
that their counsel was highly valued that their advice was respectfully listened to and followed because knowledge gave them the power to speak and learning and wisdom gave them the authority to pronounce their opinion studying these cases which can be multiplied a hundredfold we come to a very definite opinion with regard to the position of women in ancient india and we see that they enjoyed a wide and deep education and a dignified liberty while the marriage relation was close and indivisible while the husband was regarded as the head as the lord and as the guru nay even as representing god himself while there was that complete unity which we find in india alone and a complete subordination of the wife to the husband yet this did not prevent woman from exercising lofty functions from playing her part in the family and in the world and so in making up that perfect human judgment and action which only come where both sexes are joined together and where the wisdom of each conduces to right judgment and to right activity that is but a poor imperfect picture of the part that women played in those ancient days clearly here we have the signs of high intelligence clearly here we have the signs of deep and wide education of women in ancient days we have here nobly developed types of womanhood women of heroic stature women of grand and inspiring power no wonder that indian marriage has won the admiration of the world when such types of womanhood and wifehood are found scattered throughout the records of ancient literature and when all this greatness and nobility form an integral part of the woman's life end of section eight read by sandra 2022